Thomas More, Thomas Cromwell, those people. He's just really like a, a side note, you know, he's a bystander. He crops up a little bit, you know, tutoring Princess Mary, but we don't really look into him. So I think you can look at that whole Tudor narrative and, and, and the great stories without really encountering Vivez. Um, but for me, I, I discovered him, I've got a, a good friend here and I was giving him a, a book called Disinherited by Henry Carmen about the exiles from Spain. And, you know, really with the context of his family having fled the Franco regime in the, in the, in the 60s, yeah. coming to Australia. And because I have a specific interest in Sephardic Jews and Jewish history, I just thumbed through the back and I looked at Sephardic Jews and there was Juan Luis Vives, never really heard of him. I thought, I'm gonna, gonna look into that. And, you know, when you start to look at his philosophies, he really does come across as a man ahead of his time mm -hmm. in terms of what he's saying about the education of a woman being just as important as the education of a man. Um, he talks even about the, the rights and the care of animals. You know, he talks about the poor being the concern of the state rather than just being left to the concern of the church. And he talks about the mentally ill and how some people need treatment for their mental illness. And he talks even about sort of, you know, terms that we, we are familiar with now, post-traumatic stress disorder. He doesn't talk about it like that, but that is what he's talking about. So I guess when I um, uh, came across him and I found that those were the things that he was saying 500 years ago, which are the things that we're talking about now, or at least we should be talking about now, you know, he started to get interesting. And then when I got into the detail of his life, you know, born the same year as the decree of Alhambra, you know, in, in which the Jews were, were, were expelled from Spain permanently, well, almost permanently until very recently. Um, coming from that Converso family background, I thought this story is gonna get interesting. And so reading about his family and his journey through Europe, I started to get a sense of what an interesting life and what a great man was and so I just thought well you know there must be a book about this guy you know there must be a specific book not just the um academic books that, that we can find you know that, that, are, that are great but they're they're rather heavy going um so I'm like so where's the novel where's my intro you know where, where's the film perhaps it's in Spanish you know and just realizing there, there was no film um though there was no novel and I thought oh well I've got to got to do that before somebody beats me to it right. so that was kind of my intro into Juan Luis Vives. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. So yeah, you know, it's interesting because a, a lot of times historians or maybe people who have more of a of an interest just from entertainment tend to put things in in boxes. So, you know, England was England and and that's what was going on there. And yet there was so much more happening obviously in the world and um that that influence with Catherine of Aragon and so um understanding these relationships and, and I think you do a good job of showing how Henry VIII felt about um, Jewish people and, um, you know, his more tolerance. But so can you explain, just so we have a backstory, you mentioned the decree of Alhambra and yeah. 1492 and, and all of that. Can you give me a, a sense of the Inquisition and where it reached to and you know, it's yeah. funny because I, I have a hard time saying Spanish Inquisition without going into Monty Python. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> Our chief weapon is surprise. Um, yeah. But, you know, it, it kind of was. Um, yeah. So can, can you tell me a little bit about what the, the brief Spanish Inquisition from the context of English history and what the English people would have known about it and how it would have impacted that? Sure. Well, I guess the Jews have been living in Spain since, you know, just after the, the you know, the, the expulsion from, from Jerusalem, you know, so living really in Spain for, you know, sort of 1400, 1500 years, if not, if not more, prior to the final decree of Alhambra, you know, as you said. But I guess the Inquisition had been brewing for quite some time. It didn't just come along in, in 1492. And there were, you know, pogroms and, and massacres going back into the 14th century. So by the time you get into the the late 15th, you know, the golden age of, you know, Muslim, Christian, Jewish Spain with all that great flourishing of literature and, and, and arts had kind of gone, you know, we were kind of getting into a into a monoculture and there had been great pressure on, on the Spanish Jews to convert, you know, for, for several hundred years before the final decree of Alhambra was passed. And, you know, we know, we know that 
the, the Vives family, or at least his mother's family, his mother was called Blanquina March, um, that she converted very late in the day, it was 1491, so it was just one year before mm -hmm. the decree. Um, so his family maintained that Jewish tradition quite late on in, 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 in the piece, and we never know quite how genuine those conversions were. Some of them seem to be 100% genuine. Some of them seem to have been not genuine at all. And, and some Jews were practicing secretly through really, you know, we can see from the Belmonte Jews in Portugal through to the 1960s, 1970s, you know, they just kind of came out then. So there was everything on that sliding scale. I guess when it comes to England and the Jewish history, the Jews have been expelled um, in 1290. So there hadn't really been an official Jewish population in England, but, but we know through looking at the records that the Jews came and went, and there was a, what we call the Domos Conversorum, which is in Chancery Lane, in, in, it was in Chancery Lane um, in, in, in London, um, was a house for, for sort of repentant Jews. Um, and they kept coming through, and there are names of, of English Jewish people who sort of submitted themselves to the, the Domus and, and, and were sort of taken care of there. So there was a small Jewish presence. Um, and before Henry VII um, uh, uh, allowed Catherine to, to marry our Prince Arthur, um, there, there must have been a Jewish presence in London because he says to uh, Henry, I will not allow you to marry Catherine until you get rid of the scurvy of the Spanish Jews who have made their home in England. And he says, okay, done, I'll get rid of them. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no evidence of any sort of pogrom or, or English Inquisition, mm -hmm. you know, and by the time we get to later on to, to Henry VIII's reign, we can definitely see pockets of Jewish people in London. There's the Agnès family, and we get names, the Levi's, the Cohen's, you know, fairly <laughs> convincing Jewish, Jewish names and, and their contacts often masquerading as um, uh, merchants, you know, so in, in spice traders, you know, in, in, in the pepper industry, you know, the pepper trade going through to the, what became the East Indies. So, so there was a small Jewish population uh, in, in London in the time of Henry. Um, and, um, you know, it's thought that, you know, up to 19 of his court musicians were, were Jewish, um, you know, yeah. And so, so, so there definitely was a small population there in, 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 in England. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. And it, it's interesting that your book, you know how sometimes when you find a book, then you go like suddenly they all appear and sure. Jew, Jewish people in medieval history has just been popping up for me, not just your book, but uh, the guy CJ Sampson who wrote the Matthew yeah. Shard Lake mysteries. Yeah. He has one um, that's not Matthew Shard Lake, but it's, uh, it's called the sacred stone and it traces the stone that was at, fell in Greenland and the places where it went and it's considered a magic stone and it wound up in Norwich in a family of Jewish people who the markings on it, they thought it was Hebrew markings. And so it was thought that it had these magical powers. And uh, and so I was reading more about the Jewish experience in, in Norwich during that time. And, and that um, there was a, a large population there too. So it seems like there, there's been this Jewish history yeah. in England and it was kind of a push and pull where the monarch was able to use them for money lending and things like that. But then when it got too bad, they expelled them. Is yeah. that kind of... Yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, and I, I think, um, oh, what was Aaron of Lincoln, you know, in 1290, he, he was the richest man in England, you know, Henry II um, owed him the equivalent of billions of, of dollars, pounds, you know, euros, whatever we call it now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's actually quite convenient just for him to not pay that debt, get rid of him and get rid of the whole people. Yeah. You know, yeah, and, and I think this was part of, you know, the, the thing in Spain as well, you know, the, the, the Jewish population, they're often very wealthy, the Vives family came from a long line of wool and cloth merchants, you know, there, there was wealth there, you know, so I'm not saying that was the only thing that was going on, but, you know, it was, it was pretty important, I think, as a reason why that they were got rid of from all those countries throughout Europe, you know, from, from the Middle Age, from the 13th century onwards, yeah. Right. Okay, so then bringing it back to Juan Luis, um, how did he, can you explain kind of his early life and how he wound up meeting Thomas More? And yeah, sure. So, so he, 
One, uh, Luis Vives, he, he was born in 1492 in Valencia and he had a very good education. He came from a long line of very well-educated people. And, um, you know, he talks about his time in school and it was very dialectic, it was very uh, argumentative. Um, you know, he says that the, the boys wrangled at breakfast, they wrangled at lunch, they wrangled in the playing fields, you know, they wrangled in the sweating room, whatever that was, you know, probably some sort of slaughter or something in the way they get, you know, for, for cleanliness. Um, and, and so, you know, this argumentative, discussive kind of um, background was, was, was what he was brought up with, you know, it almost reminds me of the Shivas in, in, in Israel, you know, where the young, you see the young Orthodox boys discussing every little, you know, minute eye of Torah. And I think that was his childhood and that was his education, discovering every minute eye of the Bible and, and also the, yeah, the, the rest of the, the Renaissance, you know, looking at Plato and Aristotle again. So he came from a very well-educated background but um, in 1509 he left Spain and he never went back he went to university in the Sorbonne in, in, in Paris and um, you know it was probably just that that increasing pressure of the Inquisition his father had already been arrested you know his aunt had been burnt at the stake you know cousins were arrested I think the pressure just got really really intense you know he got a way out you know there, there, there was still money in the family obviously the the, the the family paid for the education in the Sorbonne and he stayed there for five or six years um, before going on to university in Louvain and then on to Bruges. So by the time the action starts in, in my novel, you know, he's, he's, he's established in Bruges, Bruges and he's teaching the sons of the nobility and he's conversing with Erasmus and he's conversing with, with Thomas More. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's some thinking that he may have met Sir Thomas More at the Field of the Cloth of Gold. So he may have been acting as an interpreter um, and as Thomas More was, but, but certainly by sort of 1521, they knew each other, they had met and they had this great sort of collaboration and meeting of minds, you know, and, and More says that no one surpasses Bevez in terms of the quality and measure of his studies. Um, mm. So, you know, that, 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 and, and, and More traveled to, to the Low Countries, you know, to Flanders really quite, Often, you know, people were, I think, were more mobile across that part of the, of the channel more than I'd realised until I did all this, this, this research. Yeah. So he was, you know, he was there 15, you know, in the early 1520s. And because of, of, of Thomas More's um, close connection with the royal family, you know, Henry and with Catherine and with Princess Mary, he was looking for someone to really take over that, that tutoring of, of Princess Mary. So that's why he invited um, Bevez over to England and he went over in 1523. Um, and took up a position at the University of Oxford. You know, he became known as um, Dr. John Lewis of Oxford. It's like the English couldn't get their head around Juan Lewis. <laughs> um, and soon after became tutor to Princess Mary. That's, mm. that's awesome. So I, it reminded when you said about John Lewis and your writing, um, you write in this very stream of conscious because it's the secret diary. And so you write yeah. the way people would write. Um, but I think it's interesting. I, I wanted to ask you about your Spanish because you write in English. I live in Spain. You write in English the way Spanish people talk in English to me. Um, so it, it, it's, it was very dramatic and it's very, the, and just the way the sentence structure is, it, it looked as if it had been translated from Spanish to English. And so I, yeah. And I, I wanted to ask you about the way you wrote it and the I saw in your acknowledgments you did acknowledge somebody for Spanish translation. Do, do you have a background in Spanish? Because it's just no. I don't. People okay. think I'm Spanish. They say I look Spanish, I act, but I'm not actually Spanish. Okay. Um, but I think when it comes to um, Vives, and I think it's this area of my father's family, we we know that. But um, when, when it, and my mother's family, the Alicia family, you know, were Sephardic Jews that that lived in in that part of London, were going back quite a few generations. Um, uh, but I think when it came to trying to channel Vives, I really wanted to do him justice. So I just read just about everything I could about Vives. And I read so many books about medieval Spain and Spain during this period. And um, it was like being a character actor, really. You know, I, I kind of had to 
I went out very early in the morning before sunrise. I walked my dog, get my energy, and then I would just channel him and I'd write for a couple of hours. I could keep that energy going for a couple of hours and then I'd just be done. I'd have to leave it until the next time. Mm-hmm. So it was really trying to channel everything I learned. And I, I played Spanish music in the background and, and I'd even listen to Spanish film and Spanish radio in the background. And I might not even understand what, what was going on, but I'd really try and channel that, that Spanish energy. So it's lovely to hear that that's come across. Yeah, it really did. I wondered whether you had initially written it in Spanish and then translated translated it because it it read so much the way Spanish people talk in English to me wow. so yeah yeah that would be good. Yeah. Um, so we've got him then going to Oxford and I wanted to ask you at this point then his his educational theories about women if you could just share a little bit about what made him so radical um, yeah sure I mean I think that whole thing when we look back from 2020 eyes you know it it doesn't seem that radical but when you look to that period you know it certainly it certainly was that the education of a woman is as important as the education of a man and that she should be taught not only those those traditional skills like dance music embroidery Mm -hmm. but but really much wider so that he was talking to and teaching princess mary about the the writings of erasmus and sir thomas more utopia um, but also Aristotle, um, uh, Plato, um, Plutarch, you know, the, the, the great the classical philosophers. So it was very important for him to, to teach her about, about these great philosophers. And also um, language, you know, so he wanted to teach her Greek and Latin, which he did, you know, and so by the time she was nine, she could actually write a letter in Latin. And, you know, and she was a very, very bright child. Um, so, you know, a lot, a lot of aspects to her edu- education, grammar, uh, vocabulary, astronomy, mathematics, philosophy, a really wide ranging, really yeah. wide ranging education. And, and I, I've just got this little book here, you know, that he actually devoted to, to Catherine of Aragon, The Education of a Christian Woman, which he wrote, you know, quite, quite substantial uh, about that time, about when he was going into to teach Princess Mary. There was just sort of the beginning of it. I thought I might just 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 read the, the opening paragraph of his dedication to, to Catherine, if you don't mind. Um, I, uh, moved by the holiness of your life, this is to, to, to Catherine of Aragon, an ardent zeal for sacred studies. I have endeavored to write something for your majesty on the education of a woman, a subject of paramount importance but one that has not been treated hitherto by anyone among the great multitude and diversity of talented writers of the past. For what is so necessary as the spiritual formation of those who are our inseparable companions in every condition of life. Um, With good reason, Aristotle says that those states that do not provide for the proper education of women deprive themselves of a great part of their prosperity. So, um, you know, again, going back to that Aristotelian kind of ethics, you know, that the, 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 the role of a woman is just as important as the role of a man. And probably, you know, by the time he's tutoring Mary, it looks like there's less likelihood of more children arriving mm-hmm. to Catherine and Henry anyway, you know. And so the possibility that this person would become the Queen Regnant. Um, so taking that role very, very seriously. And I wanted to ask you your your position on Mary because you kind of hint at her later becoming, you know, much more intolerant. Uh, and yeah. and I, I have a very soft spot in my heart for Mary because I think she had a really crappy life. Um, oh, but yeah. I, and I wanted to ask you like at, at you have her saying a couple of things early on about you know she wanted to burn people or you know wanted to punish people. Do you think that she really would have had that stance that early? And if so, like, can you explain, elaborate a little bit about your th- your thoughts on her? Yeah, I mean, I, I like like you. I mean, I, I I have a soft spot for for Mary and for probably for quite a few of the characters that don't come across quite so flatteringly in in in, in the novel. Um, you know, but I think she was isolated quite early on. I, I think, you know, that, that she was living in Ludlow and, and it was it was cold and, and dark and, and I think she felt abandoned by her parents. So I feel that sense of, of anger sort of developed quite early on. And, and I think what I read is, is that she 
also had another side to her that she had that sort of sense of humor as well and that that she was could be quite a naughty girl and she preferred playing games you know to her studies and I think Vez tried to bring her back into her studies but I, I just get the impression that the seeds were sown of sort of feeling like abandonment quite early on and then when we get to the later parts so into the later 1520s when Anne Boleyn is, is coming through an influence in the court and the Boleyn faction um, so not quite so much in the early 1520s, but the later parts of the book, she's starting to get really angry about what's happening to her mother and her potential future role in, in, in the realm. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, I just, when I hear about the way she treated Elizabeth when Elizabeth was motherless and you know she could have been so horrible to her and yet she was so kind to her and and was wow. so gentle with her and it's just like oh mary i love you you get such a bad i know <laughs> yeah reading about um edward's coronation you know and, and um, mary and elizabeth um and anne of cleves rode in together and that's just the most lovely picture that, that you get yeah yeah such a, such a shame you just want to freeze that moment um <laughs> But you talked about the, her psychology, and I think that is a good segue into Vives and his, um, they call him the father of modern psychology or, you know, one of the, one of the giants. Um, and in your book, you show him going to Bedlam and, um, you know, kind of being interested in that from, an, well, during your whole novel. So can you explain to me a little bit about his theories on psychology? Yeah, absolutely. He, he, he was very interested in um, ob observation. So, so very much like psychoanalysis, really, in just sitting back and looking at people's body language, their mood and, and their effect. So, you know, really, the, the, I, I don't know of any earlier reference to that way of engaging in some kind of, sort of medical dialect with with another you know so I think this is why he's, he's known as the godfather of, of psychoanalysis so he's very very astute powers of observation not not just of others but also of himself he has that ability to write about himself and the sadnesses of what happened to his family as if he's looking from the outside in um, and you know and he writes about like I, I've mentioned earlier you know, what we'd say in modern is in modern terms is post-traumatic stress disorder so he writes about how one can be going about one's life and see something triggering that takes the person back to an event that happened when they were a child and the whole physical manifestation of that takes over you know and, and I've got aspects of him having sort of some sort of fit you know in in the book when he sees things and, and smells things that trigger him because he wrote about yeah. that and I think it's also quite interesting you know, he mentions um, what I think we would probably call addictions, you know, in, in, in the modern language about great passions. And if you have a great passion that you can't resist, that's causing you harm in your life, you need to replace that with another great passion that's not so harmful. So, you know, really, you know, really interesting that in, in the 1520s, he's talking about post-traumatic stress disorder, he's talking about psychoanalysis and, and perhaps talking about addiction as well. Yeah, that is amazing. Yeah. And you uh, you have him then and that is segues into my question about his relationship with the Moore family and a particular Moore daughter um, because yeah. he goes to Bedlam with Margaret Roper um, yeah. and you have them having and I don't want to give too much away but they have quite a close relationship. Can you uh, talk a little bit about where you got that from? Is that completely historical? Storied up, or is there some some background on that that you can share? I believe there is some background about. I mean, I I, I read an article some years ago um, from the Vez conference in two thousand five. I think the the writer's name is Eugene Olivero, and um, he that was he wrote, the paper I found. That was well. that was you know, yeah. that's right, and it's a fascinating paper. And he he kind of suggests that there was some form of relationship between Vez and Meg Roper. Um, and he's quite interesting. He's very tactful the way he says it. He says, I don't want to suggest anything, but he doesn't quite go as far as to say that they were having an affair and there's no direct evidence, but 
Hervez writes about all the, the, the children of, of the Moors with the greatest respect and greatest admiration. And we know that he stayed with the Moors first in Bucklesbury House in the, right in the city of London, and then later in the later parts of the book in, in Chelsea when they'd moved out of the city down, down to Chelsea. And so he, he did stay with the family. And there's one letter where he references very cryptically his affection for Margaret Moore or Margaret Roper. You know, she's known by her by her married name. Um, and, you know, it seemed when he'd publish a book, she'd publish a book. It was almost like sort of what I, you know, I can do, you know, I can do what you can do, I can do better. Mm. Um, you know, and so there's some suggestion that they were sort of almost like competitive with each other on an intellectual level, but had a great deal of affection and respect for each other. Um, we know that he visited hospitals and he was known as Dr. Vives, um, Cardinal Wolsey called him Dr. Mellifluo because he was so mellifluous with his <laughs> language, with his speech, you know, as she was, you know, also known as the most intellectual, the, the greatest woman of her time in terms of her intellect and wit. So I think it was a real meeting of meeting of minds and just that suggestion from the paper that there may have been some kind of more connection. Well, like, you know, I, I wanted to explore that and, and write that in the novel. Mm. Yeah, and it, it adds a, a tension to it. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. helpful too in the development. And I wanted to ask then about his relationship with Thomas More, because Thomas More is not known for being particularly, um, uh, I don't know, tolerant of different mm. people, yeah. Yeah. Um, especially later on. So can you share a little bit about how you developed that relationship and what kind of um, struggles you had with making it work and all of that? Yeah, I wanted to develop the great banter between the great men. You know, and um, I, I wanted that to be an enjoyable part of the book for, for readers, um, that they were trying to outdo each other with their wit, but also that it always ended on a good note. It always ended in humour. Um, you know, Pervez says, you know, that he was just such a great friend to me that he's been put on this earth for the purpose of friendship. You know, it was a really lovely sort of quote from Pervez. And Pervez comes up with these wonderful quotes. They're really quite, quite moving. Um, but uh, as we know later on, you know, Moore became increasingly intolerant, you know, and increasingly paranoid. Um, uh, and the main focus of his attention was, was against the Protestant faction. But, you know, he, he also probably was becoming increasingly anti-Semitic as well. And so that tension is kind of written into the, the book and, and a bit of sort of, you know, distancing later on in, 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 in the novel. Yeah. yeah. Interesting, interesting. Um, and then I uh, I wanted to ask you about the Boleyn sisters because you show mm -hmm. him meeting them early on in yeah. France and then later on. And, and it seemed like the timeline with, and I said this when I emailed you and my questions with yeah. Anne, her plotting and, and becoming a, a rising part at court was a little earlier than other things that I've read. And I, I kind of wanted to ask you um, where you, like how you developed that and what, what yeah. the process was. Well, I, think, I think if we assume Anne was born in 1501, you know, she would have been sort of 22 by the time that, you know, they meet in England, but they were both in, in Paris at the same time in, in 1514, I think that, that Anne was, you know, in, in, in the court of Queen Claude. And it's thought that they both were influenced by Margaret of Navarre, who was the, the sister of, of, the, of the French King Francis. And um, um, so it may well be that they met in Paris that they were aware of each other. That, that I'm sure they were aware of each other if they hadn't met. So I've written in, you know, some early meeting there. Um, and, and, and I guess, you know, in, in the, by 1523, when they meet again in, in England, you know, Anne is, is betrothed to Thomas Mer Percy. Um, and that didn't go anywhere because I think her uncle intervened or, or prevented the, the marriage from, from, from going ahead. But I think coming from the background that she came from and knowing what we know about Anne, it could well be that she was trying to increase her social standing and her chances of developing an even higher role in the future at that time. It is a bit early in the narrative, um, but later on when, when Vives goes back to England in, in the late 1520s, obviously that's that's the high time when, when, when the Bolin faction work was sort of coming through. Mm. Sure, sure. I love these, when Anne was in France, these different books. I think Alison Weir has one where she, or no, 
somebody has one where she potentially met Da Vinci because he was there at the same and right. I like, love these little people that Anne um, and you know when she was um, at uh, potentially meeting all these different um, musicians and hearing Josquin music originally I just I, I love these these scenes of right. Anne doing that so I I, I, I enjoyed that meeting of of them early on when when she was young, um, I, I liked that. So thank you for, <laughs> for putting that in. That was fun. Um, and then I, without giving again too much away, I wanted to ask you about this idea of Catherine of Aragon and her marriage to Arthur, which you bring up some stuff with that. So um, you know, I'll leave it to you how much you want to say about it because I don't want to, to yeah. give everything away. Um, but what you have the, the marriage going further and, um, and I guess I just wanted to ask you what, again, the, the process of what you've read that might've suggested uh, that and, and kind of what your thinking was there. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I guess I see no reason why that that marriage couldn't have been consummated. I know Catherine denied it later on, um, but we know for certain that that Vivez and Catherine were extremely close, and that she confided confided in him things that she didn't confide in others. And Cardinal Wolsey didn't like it one little bit, and he really felt they had no right to confidentiality. And you know, later on, Wolsey um, expelled Vivez from Oxford. And really turned against Vivez. And, and so I guess what I'm finding out is, is that there was this unusual closeness between uh, Queen Catherine and, and, and Vivez, especially sort of, you know, from 15, to up to about 1528, 1529. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, I, I wrote in there breaching the confidentiality, things between the, the two of them that she may have confided in into Vivez. And, you know, mm -hmm. although she denied vehemently that that marriage was ever consummated, none of us will ever really, really know. Right. <laughs> There's no way really right now. Yeah. But I did write in there that that he knew that mm -hmm. that had that it had been consummated. And yeah. that becomes part of the fabric of the, of the plot of the novel, bearing in mind this is this is historic fiction. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Now, and I thought it was interesting, the closeness that they did have and the tension for him uh, with her being the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella I, and yeah. how that would have how that would have been for him talking to this person who was the daughter of the person who killed his family um, yeah. and how that tension that he would have had in this kind of for her, she probably would have assumed that he was too. Well, I, maybe you can tell me, like, how did they overcome that um that potential barrier yeah i mean I, I think he he was very kept very quiet about his judaism it was it was really the only way that people could survive and yeah. we know you know then and after that that people lived outwardly as as christians for many generations but but we know that when they got out of spain or out of belgium or, or england where they were and got to say parts of italy or constantinople where it was okay to outwardly profess your Judaism, that people went back into Judaism. So I, I feel that he may have kept those aspects of himself very quiet from, mm. from the queen um, and won her confidence. But I think he had a really, really good point. You know, it, it was because of her parents inaugurating the decree of Alhambra uh, that basically what befell his family Mm -hmm. befell them you know we, with uh, great uh, you know terror and um, great consequences for for the family and, and later on in their relationship there is a kind of parting of of the ways and you know I, one of his last letters to her he says that my conscience is greater than the conscience of kings mm -hmm. so I think when he's out of England he's not going back into England he can kind of let some of that through but I think all the time he's in England, he's got he's probably got a vested interest and perhaps even in her safeguarding the family that he has left in Spain through her connections and her contacts in maintaining a sort of really close relationship with her. Mm. Yeah, it, it made me think about in, in I'm obviously American, this polarized world that we live in now um, and 
people getting divided up into teams and you're on this side and that means I don't like you because I'm on this side but then actually when you come together just as individuals and you build these relationships on an individual level um, you decide that actually you do have quite a lot in common and you can overcome that and it seemed like that was a good example of, of yeah. that of people yeah. yeah I think so yeah I think so yeah, yeah. Um, it seems like your your book is quite a quite a, a good book to read at this point with all of the the polarization that's going on not just in America but all over the world um, to to remind us all that we're all human and that we all you know yeah. Um, well, well, Homo sapiens, you know, we, we can yeah. all interpret with each other. <laughs> you know, we have the same DNA, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and and you know those things that that are common, you know, uh, bind us, you know, through these periods of, of insecurity and, and and difficulty. And you know, I think it it, it is a, a good good book to read now. And I think it's you know it, it's he was very anti persecution and mm. um, anti war. You know, and um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Be nice to bring him back and have a discussion with him about things happening now. Um, yeah. So I'm just looking through my questions here, seeing if there was anything that I um, left out. Oh, just kind of his that he another struggle that he had for himself was this: Do I choose the easy path or do I choose? The hard path of um, you know trying to save my family and trying to make England uh, a place that's safe for Jewish people, or can I should I just go back to my wife and and should I just go back and live an easy life? And and can you explain a little bit maybe about that internal struggle that he had? Uh, yeah, I think he was very very conflicted. You know, I, I think he had this this overriding. Um, you know, they're talking in, in Hebrew, tikkun olam, which means repair of the world. I think he felt that was his duty, you know, to to repair the world. But I also think that he was very, very badly traumatized by what he saw as a child. Mm -hmm. And then what later on happened to his family that, that, that remained in Spain. So um, I think he, he felt that he had this overriding need and urgency because his life was potentially limited and generally people didn't live into their 60s and 70s to get as much in there as, as he possibly could, um, to do as much as he could. Um, and, and I feel that he wanted to try and create a safe haven for his family and for his people, potentially to do what he could to make England a safer place for minorities, not just the Jews, but probably all other sorts of minority groups as well. Um, but it came to a point in the end, and again, I don't want to give too much of the, of the plot away, where it just became too difficult. And he had this sort of one last opportunity to get to safety and, and, and the, the lure and the temptation of that, you know, was overwhelming. And, and when he got back to, 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 to Bruges, that was when he settled down and managed to do a lot of his greatest work, you know, in terms of his writing and, you know, sort of anti-church, you know, polemics that, that, that he issued at that, at that time, you know, and he, and he says that he writes the Pope. And one of the things I love about Bevez is that he lets the, the big people have it. You know, he warns Henry VIII against arrogance and that, you know, um, uh, the, the, the French king was imprisoned, you know, temporarily by, by the Holy Roman Empire. And he said, this can happen to you. And Vervez wrote to the Pope and said, two things I require of you, which is, you know, I think is marvellous. You know, one is to, si to silence the rush to arms amongst your princes. And the other thing is to silence the, the rush to sedition amongst your people. You know, so it was really at that time when he when he got back that he could actually get some sort of um, surrender to the fact that, you know, his life on earth was was limited anyway, and that he could actually give forth some of these great philosophies that had been brewing in, in, in his mind all the time. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Um, yeah, and yeah. Your, your background is you were an archaeologist for- Absolutely, for yeah. I was. I studied archaeology at the University of York, um, 85 to 88. And then I worked at the Museum of London. Um, and we worked on rescue digs throughout the city. So all these areas, you know, Bishopsgate, Houndsditch, all these areas in the guilt, all these areas that, that, that I write about are areas that I know very, very well. You know, my family came from that part of London, you know, the, the real sort of outside edge of London, you know, Houndsditch is, is where they lived, you know. So I have a very strong connection with it. Um, mm -hmm. I was a tour guide at the British Museum in, in the uh, medieval galleries there for a number of years. 
and I worked on lots of lots of gigs throughout England you know I, I guess in, in the end it became a bit like being an actor you know you have a gig for a bit then you lose your gig you know you're traveling all over the place and so I, I became a I retrained and became a physiotherapist um, and that's what I do now you know I have a, have a little business here in Sydney I've been here 20 years but you know to me there's there's no passion like this love of the of the past you know of, of, of history and um it's always been the Tudors and the Stuarts and on the Tudor end of the of that spectrum um mm -hmm. and I felt that I had nothing more to say about the the, the, the well-told stories um and mm -hmm. so you know just looking at this other angle is you know it's, it's been lovely for me to have that in back into my fascination you know with with the past and to be able to communicate that you know um yeah so yeah. it kind of comes full circle in the end yeah that's amazing yeah. that's awesome well, you have inspired me to go to Valencia and uh, to learn more about Vives here on the ground. So um, <laughs> as soon as COVID stuff dies down and I can get out yeah. of Andalusia, I'm going to make a trip. Um, so <laughs> thank you for that. Um, uh, is there anything that I missed that you wanted to put in about? No, I, I've got a little... Um quote of Vives in the back of the book I, which I love and, and, and I hope you don't mind if I just share it with you Please. before we, oh, wow. before we finish it'd probably take me forever to find it now it's interesting you're talking about Valencia um Margaret Roper the last letter of her father uh, the agony of Christ he sent to her from from the Tower of London mm -hmm. and in her will she leaves, leaves it to a friar in Valencia mm -hmm which is another sort of aspect to that story. It's interesting that she leaves it to the home of Vives, yeah. you know, and sort of bears some sort of, you know, testimony to that close relationship that they have. Mm -hmm. But this is one of you know, the, 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 the quotes, and it's not terribly long, you know, from, from, from the last part of his life at the very end of, of the book. And he writes, it ought to be the duty of the public officials to take pains to see that men help one another that no one is oppressed, no one wronged by an unjust condemnation, and that the strong come to the assistance of the weak in order that the harmony of the united body of citizens may grow in love day by day and endure forever. Mm. And I just think that, you know, that, that, you know, united body of citizens may grow in love day by day. It's just a lovely quote yeah. for these times that we're, that we're living in. Mm. Yeah, that's really beautiful. What a beautiful man. What a beautiful mind. I'm so glad yeah. that uh, I found your book and uh, was able to read more about him because you've inspired me like great historical fiction inspires you to want to dig to the to the truth behind it. So you've inspired me to want to do that with uh, with Vives here. So yeah, thank, thank you for you. that. Um, we did have Tiffany stop in here. So if Tiffany, if you have any questions um, for Tim, you can just raise your hand and I can unmute you or you can type it in the chat. Um, but if you don't, I will just assume that you don't. <laughs> That's fine. So uh, I will, like I said, I'll put this out on my podcast feed and on my YouTube and all my channels and I'll send you links for that. Um, and I, I just, I really am grateful for you for taking the time. I'm grateful for your writing, for writing the book and for bringing this story um, to light and sharing more about this great man than just the footnote of he was the tutor of Mary. So yeah. Thank you for that. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I've really enjoyed this, you know, mm -hmm. and um, it's lovely to have people who are interested enough for me to share this story with. So, you know, thank you very much for making the time and inviting me to your yeah. podcast. Yeah. Well, wonderful, wonderful. So, um, perfect. I think we can, we've reached a Great. natural okay. ending point. And yeah. uh, I'll send you the links when they're up then. Thank you. Oh, wait, yeah. Tiffany did say, I wonder if you could elaborate a bit about his teaching in England. Did he have other students? Oh, absolutely. You know, at, at um, Oxford, a lot of the sons of the, of the great nobility um, that, that he, he taught, Nicholas Uddle, and um, I'd have to go back through the notes to, to, to get the name, but a lot of the, 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 the sons of the aristocrats in, in Oxford, you know, he was very much involved in their education and very much in, in having a, a much more argumentative kind of healthy debate with his students. And then that comes across in the book as well. Yeah. yeah. Like a Socratic thing almost where you kind of go through and argue with each other. Yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Awesome. Well, people should buy your book and they should read your book and, uh, and check it out. And thank you so much again for yeah. your chat. Lovely. Okay. All thank right. you. <laughs> thank you so much, Tim. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>